cloud <clears throat> and all right so we are recording anytime you want to start i'm going to do the so i'll do a live intro both of you guys uh so and here's greg and hal okay scott well thank you uh, very much for the opportunity to be here greg and i are both looking forward to presenting to the group today and uh, so we, we welcome the opportunity to be here um we want to go ahead and jump right into this um, and go with the title that we've kind of just randomly picked here, testing rib technology in a de-expedition environment. And rib is our uh, three letter acronym for radio in a box. And it's a remote system that, uh, that uh, George AA7 JV has developed. And basically the, the other concept for this and using the, the term ribs, uh, you know, some of us like to think about ribs in, in this context, but this in ham radio terms is taken on a, a meaning that's kind of vital to what Greg and I, uh, what our interests are, and that's in, in uh, DXing and de-expeditioning. And so for those of you that, that are DXers or de-expedition, uh, and for that matter, any other uh, two-way radio contact, it's a, it's a basic formula uh, you, you basically have to be on the air or QRV and the DX has to be QRV to, to make the two way exchange, uh, to get your DX CC in, in said another way for the DX or he must be in the chair and, uh, for the DX, he must be on the air. And, uh, this is a example of a, a picture from the 2007 BS seven H Scarborough reef, the expedition, uh, the expedition that uh, garnered a lot of controversy and, and still um, uh, people talk about whether um, be, uh, Scarborough Reef should or should not be on the DXCC list, but that's uh, not an argument for or discussion for here. Uh, but uh, if you take a look at that, uh, you can see it's quite an interesting setup uh, with the operator perched up on top of that rock jutting up out of the water. Um, for those of you that are familiar with uh, Club Logs 25, most wanted list. If you go down through there, um, you'll find that, that Scarborough Reef right now is, is number four on the list. It's the fourth most wanted DXCC entity that's out there. And um, the, the interesting thing about the, uh, the 25 is they're all, every one of these are restricted. You can't just go there and operate. There's something, uh, some kind of a restriction that's going to uh, keep you from gaining access. Uh, of these 25, 21 of them are islands, atolls, rocks, or reefs, which, which requires either um, a boat access or in a few of their cases, of the cases, uh, they do have uh, uh, air, airstrips or airport where you can land there, but they're restricted for other reasons. But many of these are protected uh, environmentally. You, you have to get special permit from various agencies to, uh, to get access. Um, and so getting that yes for the expeditioners such as Greg, myself, and some of the other guys that, that do this sort of thing uh, can be quite a, a difficult challenge because you have to get special permits, licenses, and so forth from the parent entities, uh, government or their military in some cases, uh, environmental agencies or uh, other private governing agencies or bodies and in some cases it's actually it's a combination of these but but the whole trick is to get that yes now in the past uh 15 or, or so years we've seen a lot of these uh, dxcc island entities move up the list uh, because they've been designated as, as protected or eco reserves uh, by the uh, by the governments that actually own own the islands and uh, as a result uh unfortunately the amateur radio de-expeditioners are being denied access. And, um, and, you know, I'm not going to, to chastise any of these agencies. They're, they're uh, well-intended in what they're trying to do. And, you know, maybe in, in the past, uh, some of the, uh, maybe some of the hams or other activity uh, groups that have gone to these islands haven't been such good, good players. Uh, but I do know for a fact that from a, a recent uh, federal agency denial to a permit application, um, this was their response. Uh, the increased footprint required to accommodate the proposed amateur radio camp and personnel would negatively impact the island's terrestrial habitat. And so that's uh, uh, one, of the, one of the things that we're dealing with. Now we go back and look at this top 25 list again. 
we'll see that five of them or 20%, these are actually US protected uh, uh, possessions or islands, uh, which require special access either from Fish and Wildlife Service or some agency uh, in some states, uh, particularly um, uh, I refer to, to Curie, which uh, you have to go through the state of Hawaii. But anyway, the, so you're dealing with, with uh, um, agencies of the U.S. to get to at least these five and that are in the top, in the top 25. Now, obviously, you know, the people that are reviewing these permit applications, they don't want to make a mistake or, or you know, look stupid or, or mess up. They don't want to slip on the, on the banana peel. Uh, and so the, the typical response that we find is it's just a lot easier for them to say no uh, to, to kind of cover their uh, rear ends. And, and, you know, we can, we can understand that. And so the challenge becomes uh, for us uh, to, to find some way around this wall or through this wall or over this uh, wall uh, to, to, get the, to get that yes. And so we have to be uh, as creative as possible to find new approaches to this. And, and so with that, uh, we introduce you to the radio in a box technology. And uh, I'm going to turn this over to Greg uh, as we see this as a possible solution for the expeditions to get access to these no-go places. Thank you, Hal. Um, it's a pleasure to be on board with you all for this presentation today and an opportunity to, to share some of the technical aspects of the rig in a box technology, uh, kind of like a go box on steroids. Uh, what we have a picture here is of George uh, AA7JV. He is the uh, visionary, the architect and the builder of this technology. Um, and uh, on the other side of the box is Mike uh, KN4EEI, and uh, Mike uh, works with George on this and a number of other uh, endeavors that George is involved in. And the picture you have, what is, I guess could be termed as generation two of the rib. Uh, it's one of two ribs that were built in the last uh, six to eight months uh, as part of a project that's being uh, uh, funded by the Northern California DX Foundation and uh, in, uh, participants also include uh, Flex Radio, who's been uh, generous enough to, to help out with uh, providing some of their technology that's used in this solution. So the, the concept is, is pretty simple. Um, the RIB is an environmentally controlled, remotely controlled radio and legal limit amplifier. Um, it's intended to, uh, to minimize the footprint on the island. Uh, the operators will work from the boat. The boat stays anchored uh, a mile or two offshore, closer depending. Uh, and it eliminates and minimizes the footprint on the island. So there's no need for shelters for humans, um, latrines, cooking facilities, disposal. Uh, the goal is to absolutely minimize the impact uh, on the footprint and um, hopefully make it easier to activate some of these uh, places that are difficult to do. Um, once a day, somebody would have to make a trip to the island, top off the generators, uh, but that's pretty much it from a, a recurring uh, visit perspective. Um, we can set up these stations <clears throat> much quicker than we can a conventional station. Um, our last trip to the Bahamas, we actually had one station on the air in under an hour. Both ribs were powered up, but uh, you know, it's, it's, it's sort of a, you know, minimizing the amount of time to get on the air, spending more time on the air while having less of an impact on uh, uh, the island itself. And it's much nicer to operate from the boat than it is from a tent on the island. Or, so or on top of a rock. <laughs> or on top of a rock, exactly. So here's a high level um, depiction of the rib. Um, each of the ribs is powered by a Honda 2000 watt generator uh, with an auxiliary fuel tank to extend the runtime. Um, the rib can switch between multiple transmit antennas, also supports receive antennas for use on the low bands. And there's a 900 megahertz ethernet bridge from the island to the boat, which uh, supports the communications from the rib back to the island, which is where, or back to the boat where the operators 
uh, the, uh, using Flex Maestros and uh, PCs for logging uh, are situated. So this is basically um, one rib. Uh, the smaller boxes are, you know, cables and such, and a toolbox. Um, <clears throat> two persons can easily handle this. Um, and this was taken probably in 2020, early on. Um, and this is just, uh, this is one of the uh, prototype ribs, if you will. And you can see in the background uh, is uh, George's other boat, the Electra, which uh, they used on this particular trip. So in contrast, this is some of the equipment that we were going to take to Beauvais with us on that aborted trip. It was also, um, some of this equipment was also used on the Pitcairn Island expedition, but the way things were packaged, um, you know, you had your, all of your antennas were in one location, all your coax was packaged together, all your radios were packaged in another set of enclosures. It was really rather bulky, as you can see, and all of this was in a 40-foot uh, cargo container, which was pretty much full. You can see the tubing overhead for the antenna supports, uh, all of the bins, um, and such. And looking at that, that was probably for Pitcairn. So here is what the footprint looks like using the rib technology. This is everything for one station, generator, tables, um, ladder for uh, assembling antennas and erecting antennas, the rib itself, um, everything fit in one tender trip or, or in this dinghy from the boat to the island. Uh, so you can see how the technology really, you know, minimizes the footprint significantly. Uh, in fact, it impacts the entire planning and logistics <laughs> portion of, of putting together an expedition because our, our, our approach is now, you know, much more efficient. Um, we don't have to worry about uh, shelters and such. And it uh, gives us the opportunity to get on the air and operate, uh, you know, much quicker and in a much more efficient manner. So here are two of the ribs set up on the island um, to give you an idea how we stage them. They're, they're on regular folding tables and each rib connects to a generator. Um, in this picture, you can see a rib and the box um, in the front is a control box for a receive antenna array. And you can see actually one of the heat exchangers uh, sitting outside. There's um, there's basically two internal cooling systems, and we'll go into that later um, when we talk about the ribs in a little bit more detail. So here, here's the block diagram, um, and I can kind of go through this pretty quickly. You can see that there's, um, we'll start with the cooling. Uh, the 1.5 kilowatt PAs are water-cooled directly. They have their own heat exchanger, uh, their own cooling pump, and their own radiator. And then the interior of the box has its another uh, cooling system, and that's just to you know cool everything in the box as a whole. Um, at the heart of the system is a data acquisition and control system that controls all the subsystems of the rib, which includes the radio, the amplifier, the two power supplies, um, and all of the antenna switching and uh, control systems that are part of the solution. So this is really a fun slide to talk to, and, and I'm going to spend some time on this slide. Um, there's two power supplies. The amplifier runs off a 50 volt uh, power supply, and the radio and the ancillary electronics run off a 12 volt supply. Next to the amplifier is a 85 farad ultra cap capacitor bank, and it is dedicated for the PA. Um, one of the things we found uh, through our experience on expeditions is that um, the nature of the, uh, the power draw from an amplifier and transceiver on an expedition is about as harsh uh, and, uh, as you can get in terms of how hard it is on the generator. Um, you, um, you'll know as soon as you key down with a, with a kilowatt station on a generator, the generator bogs down voltage sags, frequency uh, drifts as the generator tries to keep up with the, the constantly wavering load. Um, and so the, the capacitor bank performs a couple of different tasks. 
uh, it stores enough energy where it smooths out the uh, power draw on the generator. So it's not throttling so much. The result is that a generator operates easier and we actually burn quite a bit less fuel. Um, we conducted some tests a few years back um, before going on an expedition in 2016 in Abasa. And with a 500 watt station, we, we uh, learned that we were drawing 95% of the maximum fuel consumption from uh, the generator. And so with this technology, we we're, we're, don't have the number nailed down yet, but we think it's somewhere on the order of a 35 to 40% reduction in fuel um, consumption. And it all goes into you know, the, the value of the footprint and the technology that the rib brings to the table. Um, so less fuel, less emissions, um, fewer trips to the island. Uh, we can actually run a kilowatt station, kilowatt out, or 1.5 kilowatt output station off of one of these Honda 2000 watt generators. And they're really not 2000 watt generators, they're about 1600 watt generators. So um, this was uh, George's vision and, and he implemented this and it uh, is an integral part of uh, the operation of the rib. So moving next, um, the internal cooling fans. These are the fans that are actually cooling the interior of the enclosure. Um, this is a, a, a dual LD MOS 1.5 kilowatt water cooled amplifier. These are home brewed amplifiers. They're designed and built by George uh, AA7JV. And uh, they really, really work well. Um, I was really impressed with how quickly uh, this water cooling system would cool the amplifier down as it cycled in temperature. It, uh, in some ways, it's much more efficient than air cooling. So underneath um, the box with the uh, NorCal logo on it is a Flex 6700. And on top of in this box with, with the label on it is the data acquisition control module. Uh, and it controls all the subsystems in the DAC. Uh, next to it is an ethernet switch. And next to the ethernet switch is the water cooling lines and, and an air chamber that uh, keeps uh, uh, air bubbles from the cooling system. So it's just a small reservoir that sits on top of the pump. So all these systems come together, they all interoperate, they're all monitored uh, through this data acquisition and control system. And uh, it works extremely well. Um, you know, one could say, well, it's a lot of technology to bring to the table and the more complex the solution is, uh, the higher likelihood that you're your reliability is going to be impacted. And that has not turned out to be the case here. Um, the ribs um, work as if you were sitting right in front of the radio and the amplifier itself. Um, with work we're doing on the DAC system, the operators are actually going to have more information available to them as far as systems monitoring and performance than they would if the radios were actually sitting on the table in front of them. So sort of a, a block diagram of the end-to-end -end solution. On the boat, we have um, the maestro uh, or multiple maestros talking to multiple ribs. Um, the Stacy Lab computer is a, uh, a computer that's running uh, the interface to the DAC system. And uh, that's quickly going to be evolving into just a window on the station PC that's doing the logging. Ethernet switch, uh, PoE, power inserter. Um, we've tested two Ethernet bridges and they both work equally well. Uh, M900 from Ubiquity and uh, a product from Cambium Networks, which is also a 900 megahertz link. Uh, and then flipping over to the island, you've got the mirror image of the radio, the power inserter and the Ethernet switch. Um, and um, the control box and, and the flex radio and all. So this is sort of the high level um, view of the end-to-end -end solution. Uh, each of the Maestro's rib combinations require about four megabits of bandwidth. Uh, the ethernet link is delivering about 50 megabits of bandwidth. So we've got plenty of capacity to operate a six or eight station um, um, configuration without the, you know, the radio bandwidth becoming a limiting factor. This is the remote control screen. This is a, runs on that ancillary PC. And you can see that you have a number of uh, capabilities here. Um, the upper left monitors the amplifier. Uh, the center pane on the top monitors um, uh, the antenna switching. And uh, if you're using an antenna tuner, then tuner status. 
Uh, we're also adding step IR controller to this. Um, so you can switch your receive antennas on the far right. You can turn the preamp on and off. And then on the bottom uh, is um, some switching for turning the transceiver on and off if you have to do a power cycle on it, uh, internal temperature. Um, future versions of this will also have the amplifier temperature, uh, logging capabilities. Uh, so this is an area where there's a good bit of effort going into to improve uh, the visibility of the solution to the folks who are doing the operating. So um, we're using uh, dual port radios and um, we use two, two Yaggies on the island pointed towards the boat and two verticals on the boat. Um, the Yaggies in this picture are actually a little farther apart than they look. Um, the space, diver the, the diversity um, that's achieved by using two antennas um, really improves the link performance. Um, and uh, <clears throat> is a necessity. I think in further uh, tests that we'll, we'll be spacing the Aggies on the island a little farther apart. Um, but in the, the two trips that we've been down there uh, with George and Mike, uh, this link has been just rock solid. Um, it was a concern, but uh, you know, again, you know, through operating experience, we've learned that uh, we don't need to really be concerned about the performance of the link over a path that's say less than two miles long. So here is the magnet. Um, this boat uh, was put in the water um, late last year. Uh, we've made two trips to the Bahamas on this boat. Uh, it is a purpose-built de-expedition vessel. 160 foot uh, long, 44 foot beam, twin 25 horsepower diesels. Uh, it only draws five or six feet of water so it can get into fairly tight locations. And for a big boat, it's both stable and maneuverable. So here we are in Georgia shop back in November, uh, preparing for our trip to um, the Bahamas for CQ Worldwide and the ARRL 160 contest last year. George is going through some of the configuration on the Daisy Lab uh, data acquisition controller. Um, we were working on stuff right up until the hour that we packed the equipment away. Um, a number of delays uh, forced us in sort of a crunch time mode. Uh, George had to reposition the magnet a few days before we were going to leave for the Bahamas, um, which delayed uh, our staging the equipment. Here we are just getting packing stuff, making sure that we have everything that we're going to need. There are no ham radio stores or uh, electronic shops in the Bahamas. This is a, a magnet pulling away from the dock. And uh, we're just picking up the fenders and getting everything stowed away uh, for the trip. little video playing here. Unfortunately, we don't have the audio that goes along with it, but uh, everybody, everybody chips in here. And so we are heading out slowly but surely. And uh, there is Miami Beach uh, off the stern of the boat and we are on our way. Uh, we staged the ribs on the boat this first trip. We actually took four ribs along with us. So um, we mock up the island end of the um, solution on the boat while we're in transit. Uh, nice thing about the catamaran, it's nice and stable. Make sure everything's running and everything's talking as it should. Um, the only thing we didn't do here was, you know, to put RF uh, to the antenna port. Um, but everything else was tested and made sure that uh, it worked properly, that everything was... And, uh, you know, on into the night. Um, this was my first experience, so I'm still learning a lot about the solution here. And uh, we've got the four maestros up and running. They're talking to each of the four ribs. Um, and we're now approaching our destination um, at Wood Key, which is off the uh, southwest end of uh, Eleuthera. This is the captain of the boat and uh, Mike KN4EEI uh, getting ready to make the first tender trip uh, from the magnet to the island. And these trips become pretty routine. I don't know how many of them we made, but uh, 
with a, a lot of back and forth. Again, we can fit two ribs uh, and probably all the ancillary equipment and antennas uh, for one station into a single trip on the tender and contrast that back to the slide to where um, we had uh, all the equipment that was uh, stored in the, uh, the shipping container. Uh, it's you know, pr pretty significant reduction in the, both the equipment and the effort involved to turn things up. Uh, here we are approaching Wood Key and uh, the antenna configuration on uh, this trip for CQ Worldwide was um, 160 meter top loaded vertical uh, that had a, uh, a 10 meter loop off of one of the guy ropes that could, that, uh, so it made it a, um, a multi-band solution and uh, it had an integral tuner uh, at, mounted at the base of the vertical. Um, 80, 40 meter verticals. And then on 20 meters up, we had vertical dipole arrays, which uh, were wire arrays that were suspended from a single support structure. And then we had a, a four direction steerable RX array with, uh, with a low noise, high gain preamp, which we found was essential for the environment. You know, just, just getting things staged here, give you an idea of a little bit about um, the terrain on the island, all of the antennas were set up at or in the water. This is the 80 meter antenna uh, being set up. And you can see one of that, I think that's a 20 meter vertical dipole array in the background. Um, quite a bit of tide here, um, probably about three or four feet. So it's, we're trying to do most of our antenna work at or near low tide. And uh, this is a picture of the receive array, which was uh, mounted inland from the, from the shoreline. And uh, there's a control box and a, a Cat5 cable that runs back to the ribs uh, that control the control box, which is mounted at the antenna location. Uh, we use four ribs. Um, we're currently using uh, Ethernet uh, cable for connecting. We're thinking about doing wireless on the island at some point, at least testing it. Um, and um, we talked about the bridge and each rib uh, is, is a self-contained, environmentally controlled, remote operated one and a half kilowatt uh, rig in a box, if you will, or go box on steroids, if you want to look at it that way. So setting things up, you know, we're real careful not to get any salt into the boxes or in the antennas. So uh, we're rinsing our hands to keep, uh, keep them clean. Uh, all of the external connections have caps or covers, uh, you know, to keep them in good serviceable condition. Um, doing some troubleshooting. Here is the fuel setup for a uh, for two rib configuration. So these are five gallon marine tanks that are si and the generators are siphon fed from these tanks. So we have about six gallons of fuel, uh, which is enough to run us for at least twelve hours or longer. Um, and again, each these are two, uh, 24, excuse me, 240 volt generators. And so all of the, the systems are, are powered off of 240 volts, uh, which limits our uh, cabling losses from the generators to the ribs. So on the boat, we had uh, four flex maestros, which were uh, paired with each rib. Um, we had two laptops running uh, uh, VNC viewers for controlling the, the, the DAC software on the island. And again, those uh, are not going to be needed down the road as we simplify the DAC implementation. Laptops running M1 and MM for logging, and then uh, the 900 megahertz data bridge with its corresponding antennas. So this is what uh, an operating uh, position looks like. It's pretty straightforward. Um, you can actually see on this PC, we have a DAC window open on the PC in the logging software. and. Uh, the one maestro that was in operation and the two that were not being used uh, on this particular at this particular juncture when this photograph was taken. So it's pretty comfortable on the boat. Um, it's much more comfortable <laughs> operating on the island. Uh, it's air conditioned. Uh, the boat, the boat is massive. Uh, this uh, room where the radios are set up is probably 36 feet wide and 50 feet long. It has dining area. Uh, entertainment area, um, kitchen, 
It, uh, it has all the creature comforts of home. And here we are operating the contest. Um, George likes 160 meters, so he was generally on 160 or 10. And Hal got stuck with 80 and 20, and I uh, ended up on 40 and 15. Um, pretty focused effort on the contest. We want to do as well as we could. And uh, with three radios and three operators, it's uh, pretty tough to to do a 48 hour contest, but we managed to rack up uh, almost 7,500 cues, almost 8 million points. And we were real pleased with uh, the results that we achieved. And uh, we actually had two boats on this trip. Um, George's other boat, Electric, came out a couple days after we did. And while we operated CQ worldwide on uh, Magnet, we moved everything over to Electra and operated uh, the, the ARRL 160 contest, uh, which was uh, a week or so later from Electra. And this is uh, a drone shot, drone video of the island and the two boats in the background. Um, as we come around the north end of the island, you can see the 160 meter vertical. Uh, you can't pick out the receive antenna, but it's pretty much dead center on the island in this shot. As we come around the corner, you can start to see some of the other antennas. Um, Going from right to left, uh, it's 15 meter antenna, 20 meter antenna, 40 meters, and then 80 meters on the four left hands, far left hand side. Uh, the waters in the Bahamas are fairly shallow. Um, where the boats were anchored, it was probably about 10 to 12 feet deep. And around the island at low tide, you know, you're just in a couple of feet of uh, water. It's very easy to work within, except it's a little bit rocky, so footing can be a little treacherous. You can see the ribs set up now as they come into focus. Uh, there are two ribs just going out of the bottom of the picture now, the generators and the final rib. And moving along, panning out to the boats. So in summary, um, a successful is kind of an understatement. Um, and we learned a lot about the value proposition of, of this solution as, as, we, as we set it up and operated it. Um, I think now there's probably been six or so trips out there. The first uh, couple of trips were with um, the prototype ribs that uh, were first built. They were improved upon uh, in the first, if you want to call them production versions. Um, there's two uh, production ribs that have been built. There's four others under construction. So there'll be six ribs that are available uh, as a result of uh, the funding from Northern California DX Foundation that will be available to uh, to de expeditioners in the future. Um, no problems. Um, we learned that um, we can't run uh, the generators in eco mode um, and run more than one station on it at a time. So uh, you know, we spent a good bit of time um, troubleshooting what was actually turned out to be operator errors. No problems with the solution. Um, but, uh, you know, there were all experiences learned and uh, changes that were implemented uh, on the subsequent trip. Um, we lost about nine, hour, nine hours of total time in the contest, um, and we operated typically with only 500 to 700 watts output, so we did fairly well, all things considered. Um, we're, all, we're at a mindset now where a lot of the um, equipment associated with the data uh, with the link radios, uh, the antennas probably need to be swapped out each trip with a new uh, set of antennas uh, because salt uh, is just pretty harsh on, uh, on, on you know, that sort of stuff. Um, so we also operated the ARRL 160 contest. We ended up making um, just over 1,300 cues. Uh, all said and done, uh, we finished just over 9,500 cues, uh, and we have finished in first place for our class in the ARRL 160 contest, and we did well in the CQ Worldwide. I'm just not sure off the top of my head exactly where we finished, uh, but uh, we did, did, did well. We're pleased. Um, so there's a, there's a lot of cost benefits here, and I touched on the, on the logistics piece, uh, the cost of life support. You know, if you look at a typical, you know, tent and generator expedition, I would guess that at least 
half of the weight and 60 to 65 percent of the volume of the equipment that you end up bringing to the island is, is supported with just life support, housing, latrine, cooking, water, food, um, all, you know, you just take that right off the top of, of the, uh, off the equation. And we're, we're honing in on, you know, rapid deployment techniques. So we're on the air quicker. We have more stations on the air sooner. Um, D expeditions are in the business of making contacts. And the less time we spend setting up is the more time that we have to make cues. Um, we're all getting older. Uh, it's, it's not getting any easier to pull these off. But um, you know, when you can reduce your footprint as significantly as we can with this solution, it makes it easier on everybody. And um, the quality of the experience, the comfort factor, um, it's not only um, easier on the operators, um, but you know, we're going to end up making more cues faster because everybody is going to be more rested uh, in a um, you know climate-controlled operating environment. Um, it's just, you know, it's, it's amazing what a difference it makes. So. So it comes down to the, the, the question being, uh, will this radio in a box technology help, help us get the yes, uh, for the expeditions like this to the, the no go or what's considered no go locations that are environmentally sensitive and, and protected. Um, you know, we're, we're going to have to you know, at the end of the day, we're just going to have to stand by and that's the, the this COVID situation, notwithstanding, um, you know, will we see our, our friend here operating at a, a location like Johnston, uh, on a rock, uh, or, or, uh, you know, will there be a rib there? And if we, we take a, a closer look at this, we obviously see there's something missing here. And, uh, again, we go back to, uh, our, our buddy here on the rock. Uh, he has his, uh, basically the same setup, but he has, he has an antenna. He has everything going for him. Uh, our, our future in D expeditioning and DXing, uh, you know, comes down to, are we going to come up with a better way to invent the wheel or a, a better wheel? Uh, and that's, that's the vision that, that we're going to have to have to have. In other words, we're going to have to to think outside, think outside the box as the, uh, adage goes, but we have these two gentlemen here who are trying to find a solution as, uh, as Greg refers to it by thinking inside the box. And they, they have, uh, kind of developed this formula for, uh, possibly getting, getting the yes and, and allowing, uh, ham radio from some of these locations and there's many many other applications of course that would be uh where where this technology could could be used but we we go back to our friend again and we see that there there is something missing here and it's it's his antenna system now this this is the antenna system that was used at, at uh, out on midway i think in 2009 the k5m and and you see the uh the uh, vertical antennas here, the SVDAs that were used at, uh, at Midway. Well, guess what? Uh, in addition to this footprint uh, issue uh, in, in trying to get permission to these locations, there's also an issue with, with the antennas. And uh, from, an, from another agency denial, um, uh, the response was, we've determined that the deployment of vertical structures would pose an inherent collision risk to the native seabird populations on the atoll. Uh, Low-flying birds have in inhabited these open areas for thousands of years and would not be accustomed to avoiding newly erected radio operator tents, guy wires, and antennas. And so there's uh, uh, an opportunity here for uh, another solution. And so, um, we see our, our friend, he's, he's actually now sitting on a stool instead, of, instead of that, that rock, because there are three, there are three things that we're going to have to deal with. And, uh, you know, with the, the ribs, we're, we're dealing with the, the operator footprint, um, 
the inhabited island scenario that uh, that the ribs will will uh, supplant, and then one of the other legs of the stool that uh, that uh, need to deal with is the antenna situation. And so this uh, last month and in, in into March, uh, you know, Greg and I were down there uh, for the CQ WPX contest. And we had an opportunity to do some testing on uh, a low profile antenna system. Uh, and uh, and uh, also we had an opportunity to participate and do quite well in the uh, in the, the WPX contest where Greg, last time I looked, we were, were in the fourth place in the world in our category, going to get up against some pretty impressive uh, contest stations. And given the fact that we're, uh, you know, setting up and and in, uh, in a de expedition style field day style, uh, uh, I'm I'm well pleased with with that. We'll see if it holds up. But uh, we we tested the this TW antenna, um, and uh, I, I uh, had used this out on uh, on uh, uh, Wake Island the, the K9W operation. Uh, a few years back and wanted to see what kind of results we could actually generate with a low profile antenna that, that may not be uh, uh, considered harmful to the birds. And so this is the TW2010. It's uh, manufactured by DX Engineering. Uh, it's marketed as a portable stealth antenna. It's an omnidirectional center fed vertical dipole. And this, this uh, little, uh, Antenna is eight, eight and a half feet tall and about five feet wide. It weighs 10 pounds. The 2010 is, can be switched remotely uh, uh, through uh, 20 through 10 meters. And uh, the power handling will handle 500 watts on uh, data and 1200 watts phone and 800 CW. So, you know, it's, it's not a, a legal limit antenna, but it does offer a low angle, a fairly low angle uh, takeoff at, uh, at 27 degrees. And so uh, we tested this with uh, one of the, the ribs uh, prior to the contest, uh, used only a hundred watt. Uh, we didn't, didn't use the, uh, the power amp uh, during the test, operated only FT8, FT8 mode and uh, uh, had an opportunity to to do some sporadic operating over five day period, and uh, looking at the log, we ended up with fourteen and a half hours of total operating time. Did not have the best uh, conditions while we were there, and ultimately uh, ended up with three hundred sixty seven uh, QSOs in the log, one hundred fifty one on twenty and uh, two hundred and sixteen QSOs on thirty meters. And looking through the log. Um, during, during those QSOs, we recorded 22, worked 22 zones, 49 DX entities uh, on these two bands. And uh, I was quite impressed. Uh, workstations, uh, Fox Romeo, Yankee Bravo, Indonesia, worked JA, VK, uh, the Middle East, and ZL. And uh, my longest contact was with uh, VK6IR, 11,300 miles uh, on, uh, on 30 meters. And so using the Levin Central uh, software, it's an ADI to mapping software, uh, quite, a, quite a nice tool that uh, Greg turned me on to. Uh, you can see these 367 cues. This is what the log looks like visually using the TW antenna. Um, the, uh, the, taking the uh, PSK reporter log, uh, which, uh, which we downloaded and plugging that in uh, from our 20 meter operations. You can see these are the stations around the world that copied us during the times that we were on 20 meters. Uh, pretty impressive for 100 watts. These were the stations that, that copied C6 AGU off of uh, on the PSK reporter log on 30 meters on FT8. And then this is a combined of the two bands of those uh, approximately 16 hours that, that we operated uh, and uh, this, the stations that copied our, our 100 watt, actually it was closer to 85 watts uh, using the, the TW antenna. So 
this is a, a, a low profile antenna. It does offer uh, rapid deployment for portable operation. There's four parts to this. You do not have to, uh, you don't have to dig holes. You don't have to uh, erect guys. Uh, I, uh, I was able to put this thing up in 10 minutes, less time than it took to run the coax to it. It has four parts. Uh, like I say, the testing was only done on these two bands. Uh, we had wanted to do some AB co comparison testing, but didn't have the opportunity to do that. Um, again, the, the, the uh, 2010 model is capable of 20 through 10 uh, switching, which could easily be uh, controlled from the rib with the, the DAC software. Um, the uh, conclusions that the, the, from the PSK reporter log uh, showed that obviously at low power levels, you, you can work, you could work the world with that antenna. And uh, so we're, we're looking to do continued testing and uh, look at other small footprint an antennas. And uh, George has I think uh, put together, uh, uh, he's got some ideas on what he might do in the future uh, for uh, using this, this concept. So um, we're, we're very optimistic that we may be able to, to uh, clear that hurdle. Um, again, we want to do a big shout out to the Northern California DX Foundation for their, their support with this project. Uh, it's, uh, it's, it's a visionary um, it's a visionary approach, uh, trying to find a solution to, uh, a, a real issue in terms of will, will we be able to, to find, uh, opportunity to get to some of these rare, rare locations, uh, once again. And so with that, you know, I, I, I want to thank you all again for having us here. Uh, I hope that, uh, we can answer whatever questions or, or concerns. Greg, if you have anything else that you want to say in closing here. Um, it's, it's been a pleasure and uh, hope that you all uh, enjoyed uh, the story that we had to share with you. And uh, if you hear us on the air, please give us a shout.